Good morning, especially to those of you who are watching this online. Uh, this is the last of our series of conversations about the tradition of Celtic thought, Celtic spiritual practice and prayer. And I wanted to begin today with a prayer that George MacLeod wrote. George MacLeod, if you've read the chapter on him, uh, was the founder of modern day Iona, wrote the Abbey, uh, built the Abbey, rebuilt the Abbey. And, uh, so I'm going to begin with a prayer of his. It's in the in the style of St. Patrick's Breastplate, a Lorica, and we pray. Christ above us, Christ beneath us, Christ beside us, Christ within us. Invisible we see you, Christ above us. With earthly eyes we see above us clouds or sunshine, gray or bright. But with the eye of faith, we know you. Instinct in the sun ray, speaking in the storm, warming and moving all creation, Christ above us. Invisible we see you, Christ beneath us. With earthly eyes we see beneath us stones and dust and dross. But with the eye of faith we know you uphold in you all things consist and hang together. The very atom is light energy. The grass is vibrant. The rocks pulsate. All is in flux. Turn but a stone and an angel moves. Underneath are the everlasting arms. Unknowable we know you, Christ beneath us. Inapprehensible, we know you, Christ beside us. With earthly eyes, we see men and women, exuberant or dull, tall or small. But with the eye of faith, we know you dwell in each. You are imprisoned in the dope fiend and the drunk, dark in the dungeon, but there you are. You are released, resplendent in the loving mother, the passionate bride, and in every sacrificial soul. Inapprehensible, we know you, Christ beside us. Intangible, we touch you, Christ within us. With earthly eye, we see ourselves dust of the dust, earth of the earth, but with the eye of faith, we know ourselves all girt about of eternal stuff, our minds capable of divinity, our bodies groaning, waiting for the revealing, our souls redeemed, renewed. Intangible, we touch you, Christ within us. Christ above us, beneath us, beside us, within us. What need have we for temple made with hands? Okay. Well, um, I'd like this hour we have together, or 45 minutes, to uh, time of reflection and some wrap-up, I want to begin by telling you of a, well, I was going to say tell you a story, but it isn't really a story. It's, it's the recounting of an event that was formative for me. Back in my, the summer between my first and second years of seminary, I was in a program of, I was a chaplain intern at Baltimore City Hospitals. 
I was all of a brilliant 23-year-old with one year of seminary under my belt who was profoundly aware of all things godly and holy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, one of the tasks we had as chaplain is we lived on campus at Baltimore City Hospitals, uh, which back then was not a part of Hopkins as it is now. It was, um, we lived in D building, which was actually a sad, sad building. Uh, it had been used in the 50s for lots of experiments with um, frontal lobotomies to control people whose emotional presence was not always appreciated. And so we lived on a floor where there were zombies walking around. Some of them had lived there their entire lives and they were in their 50s and 60s. It was a very sad building. And so I was there on duty, on call for emergencies one weekend. And I got a call to come down to the emergency room. A young girl had just been hit by a school bus. I went down to the emergency room and the family was beginning to gather and a nurse told me that the young girl, whose name turned out to be Sonia Berman, she was 10 years old, uh, had been hit by a school bus and killed. And her family was beginning to be there. Something happened within me. And I had, I'd never seen a corpse before. I'd seen bodies in caskets at funerals, but I'd never seen just a person who was dead. And she was a pretty young girl, and the family had asked me to go in and say a prayer over her. After spending, I do not know how much time, probably not more than a minute or two, of praying with her, I left and um, went to meet with the family who were continuing to gather and were wailing and crying. And a spirit of utter competence overtook me. I was telling nurses that we needed a private room where I could meet with the family, and we would need more chairs, and it happened. Police arrived, and they wanted to interview the family and any witnesses, and I said, no, you're gonna have to wait. I was telling detectives what they may and may not do, and they, complied. It was an extraordinary moment. And for the next four hours or more, I met with the family. The grandmother was bereft, as I have seldom seen anybody bereft, saying, Sonia, will be, she'll be home for dinner. She'll be home for dinner. And my main thing that I said was, no, Mrs. Berman, Sonia is dead. And I repeated that over and over again. As we read Psalms, family talked about Sonia Berman and what a beautiful child she was. And all the memories of that day are as vivid in my mind now as they were at the time. And after oh, four, four and a half hours or so, the family left had to go home and tend to other things. And I walked back from the emergency room to D building. And it was a summer day, but that section of Baltimore overlooking the docks is not the prettiest section, at least certainly was not in the mid to late 60s. But the air smelled like pure oxygen. The grass was more vividly green than I had ever seen it. I was, for some reason inexplicable, extraordinarily happy. I 
this overwhelming sense of God having been with me for the last five or six hours. And that awareness of that holiness, I think, has never left me. It was a life-changing event for me. And what I have thought about, even at the time, I think, but certainly since, is that I was young. I was 23? No, no, I must have been 26, 26 years old. And a pipsqueak, obviously. And, no, I was 23. And, um, I could have sort of psychoanalyzed myself. Well, here I am, young kid starting seminary and it was very tense I was coming from a ugly building going into a place of great tragedy and something we had clicked in my head um, but what I really believe most deeply is that I was seeing things as I walked back from the emergency room smelled the freshness of air and the beauty of grass and the lightness of my feet and soul that I was seeing things as they truly were all the time. And that that experience was a transfigurative mo moment for me of seeing things at their depth rather than the way I normally see things somewhat at the surface. I didn't know it then, but I think that's precisely what uh, this whole Celtic tradition is about. And McLeod, um, and in the chapter, I hope you've read. Uh, please do read the George McLeod chapter because there's a lot of his writing in it. His, his poetic writing, um, but he gives vibrant expression to that sense of the indwellingness of God in all things, and the light shines. Wow! Um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So that's where I'd like to begin. Um, uh, that memory was triggered for me by the prayer that I read to begin. Um, the very at atom is light energy, the grass is vibrant, the rocks pulsate. That, that, those phrases in the prayer with which I started from George MacLeod just brought back that memory of Sonia Berman vividly for me. He was speaking my truth. Um, and there was another thing later on. Um, well, I'll stop. I'll stop. Tell me, in what way has this book and our conversation had, what effect has it had on your understanding of your faith? If none, then that's fair, that's okay. If it has in any way enlarged your faith, uh, if you can speak about that, that would be good too. I am thrilled by the ancient voices that go way back, that hold the, that faith together and, uh, and was so close to early Christianity. And with each person that we've studied, um, the central theme of God in all things and how we are who we are in our faith uh, is, is a wonderful reminder 
and I am um, find that book should be right next to the prayer book and the Bible. <laughs> <clears throat> Lee, I think um, I've been following along. A little bit louder because yeah. the, the, the okay. video will pick it up. If yeah. that we loud. want to hear every golden word. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been here every week, but I've been following it on Facebook. And, um, and I've read through everything. It just seems that it is brightened, like you're talking about making things more vivid. Uh, the importance of realizing that everything we do is sacred. It has that everything we do kind of connects with everything else. And we can either do it mindlessly and then mindless results will come out of what we do. Or we can do it with some sense of feeling that God is with us. Towards the end of being relational with each other and being relational with God and being relational with God's creation. And I think the part about God's creation is the part that we don't think about a lot. A lot of the evangelical churches emphasize individual salvation. Other evangelical churches talk about communal salvation, but not many combine that with the thought of God's creation and how we live and kind of those thin spaces, the sacred spaces. And so what we've lost really since at least the Industrial Revolution, is we've come, become disconnected. And reading John Muir, for example, says you have two ways. You can lobby Congress or take you know, political action. And that needs to be, or go to court or whatever you do to stop whatever it is we're trying, that people are trying to do. That's kind of a defensive tactic. But the most effective is love. And get people uh, involved where they, out of love, won't do these degrading things in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think to me, the fact that that, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, well, John Muir, he's in the 1800s, 1900s. But to have that go all the way back to Prior, prior to Pelagius, mm -hmm. to realize that this has gone on the whole arc of the last 2,000 years, Christianity, something different than what we think of as the institutional church uh, through Constantine, and we can really see the limitations. Uh, and so this, in, in addition to a lot of other meetings we've been doing lately, has been saying, hey, we have to take a, a longer look. We can take the institutional church as a springboard, but what are we springing to? <coughs> How can we act differently? And to me, that brings up a real uh, challenge and, and an exciting one. I think part of the thing is <coughs> is. This is educating people uh, about the their their uh, sacredness of connection to the earth. And I read the last two chapters, uh, the one on George McLeod and the one on Kenneth White, poet. And I am floored by McLeod's sermons. And this guy. And he managed to stay within the church because I guess if they threw him out, the people would go crazy. So he managed to get away with some of the biggest churches preaching his earth gospel. And uh, I, uh, it was just so powerful. Uh, and they made a lord of him. They, they did, they did, actually. Lord George McLeod. Uh, uh, 
and the other one was Kenneth White, of course, and his writings. And uh, I really resonate with all of that and uh, very deeply, and I'm so glad that I wasn't too much aware of the Celtic tradition in our church, but I am now. Uh, I, I re I've been resonating, and I still resonate with Native Americans, and I resonate with what is best in it, what I consider best in the, in the Christian, Judeo-Christian tradition. But my thought is that uh, creating some more awareness, and I belong to the Green Grace Committee uh, for the diocese, <clears throat> and what we're talking about with my suggestion, actually, is asking the bishop to ask the rectors <clears throat> to be able to place in the hands of all the parishioners a copy of the Episcopal Statement on Creation Care. It is really beautiful. Mm. And if everyone had a copy of that, at least they get some idea about what was going on and uh, uh, to start with. So, um, I, I, the other thing, second thing, the third thing would be to get people out once in a while for a walk mm -hmm. or something, you know, just to kind of experience it. And uh, what's his name, uh, Bob Adams and I are going to be organizing a little hiking group when it gets a little warmer up. Mm -hmm. kind of starting his house and walking the trails around Green Ridge and then some other places. And so uh, uh, that might be something uh, that would uh, interest some folks and just, that, that, can, that can walk. Nice. And uh, <laughs> the other thing is maybe, uh, I think maybe I mentioned this to you, uh, as we come to an end here, maybe at some point as a follow-up when it gets warmer, we could have some kind of a thing like that. Right. Thoughts I'll on combine that. the two with what you and Bob are talking about. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, that is, I, I got a glimmer of hope a couple of days ago. I think I told you uh, close to the beginning of this series that I was um, sending a copy of this book to Dean Markham, the Dean of Virginia Seminary. I told you at the time that uh, I had um, suggested a course of study in Celtic spirituality when I was on the board of the seminary 20 years ago and uh, I was dismissed as the whole tradition being intellectually lightweight <laughs> and I wrote a letter to the dean um, describing that experience of mine as a board member being summarily dismissed by the then dean um, another story about my encounter with that dean on time um, and I got a letter back on Friday thanking me for the for the book uh, and for my suggestion that the seminary invite John Philip Newell to be uh, a guest lecturer and if something comes of that that will be a great triumph, and I will keep you all very much in <laughs> uh, And in my big fantasy, when I, when, when I thought of the possibility of him being at the seminary, since somebody else would be paying his travel, we could get him here as well. So, <laughs> that's, that's a fantasy. Um, but I got a better hearing for the traditions of, Cel of Celtic stuff, and he spoke I, he, he, um, I, I encouraged him particularly to pay attention to St. Pelagius. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it was very encouraging to get a response. Uh, well, what about the, the rest of you? How, um, tell me how your life is shaped, or what your experience of God has been. And I'm not the only person to have had an experience such as I had walking back from Sonia Berman's mournful afternoon. Those of you at home be reflective about this too. Where has God been vibrantly present? I have been thinking right in the very beginning of Genesis man is told to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the earth mm -hmm. and 
And that has messed up our relationship with creation ever since. It's just the word dominion, uh, I think it has the same root as dominate. And <clears throat> at least in today's society, man feels that it must dominate creation rather than taking care of it. The root word is also dominus, which means, simply means lord. And dominate has the negative side of that, that the lordliness of God is a lordliness of caring and sustaining. Maybe you can broaden, and but you're right in that that tradition, especially in Western culture, has been to dominate in the worst sense of that word and to own creation as if it were as if it were ours rather than ours to care for we are stewards not owners and, and that's where the book has really opened my eyes is that we need to see that God really is in creation and you know we can't dominate God <laughs> <laughs> At least not without consequences. Yeah, and, and not forever. Yeah. Good. Ian, David, you, were you going to say yeah. something? Yeah, I'm going to take one last one. Quick one this. Uh, two things. One, since the book, I've changed my walking procedure. It used to be put earphones on, listen to music, you know. But then now I do, I just say, or what I've been taught is uh, situational awareness. Just seeing what's going on. <coughs> and I love it. And so it's it's a better way of doing it. I did the, the last two times. I house it, walked down to the pond, and back up the two times. And, you know, it, it changes, you know, what's going on as opposed to just you know, listening to whatever noise I'm listening to. And so that changes that. The second is very similar to what you had, although mine was a little different, um, as a volunteer fireman, I've seen death probably a lot worse than most people have seen it, unless they've done the same thing. My worst was, but it, it wasn't necessarily worse. I actually was glad I didn't see the actual child. Uh, I guess he was under two, close to two. There was a lawn care uh, company outside of the house on the eastern shore near St. Michael's and the parents thought they were doing a good job of keeping the kid inside because the truck it was a big kind of a one of those smaller dump trucks kind of like on a smallish uh they call it dually sized truck but the dump truck was and apparently the kid got out the door got hit we responded got there I think I saw what is called a papoose. It's a specialized device that you put children in, not traction, but to keep them connected. So I only caught a little bit of that. Then somehow or another, somebody, apparently they had a, a, a plastic trash can over the spot where the kid was hit. And uh, apparently at that very point, the father was outside the building and uh, the, the, you know, somebody covered it up, but he, he just went down to his knees and started hitting the ground, blaming himself. And uh, somebody said, somebody go over and, you know, hold him and just, you know, you know, make sure he doesn't hurt himself. So I, I took that on, and that was kind of like what you were saying. It was that connection of holding him and feeling whatever pain that he was going through and actually went into me and it was it was kind of hard but i understood the connection how god i guess god but whatever it was it just and it affected me for a couple of weeks because you know i only saw a little bit i you know i've seen worse people in accidents you know did but the and you know the he did, the little kid did eventually die. He was in bad shape at the time, but it was just that feeling. You know, I didn't get to have, see the sun on the way home or anything, 
because this was a different situation, but the, the, the impact of holding somebody in their, their time of horses like you were talking about. And just, it was tough, but it also kind of woke me a little bit back then on how, how feelings, you know, because I've seen TV stories, even though they're supposedly fiction, I've seen stories where people have talked about that. You know, and that, that, that feeling that people have had where they've held somebody and felt something happen to go through them. So that's... As you've talked about it, it sounds as if it is still very much with you. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. You, know, you can't forget something like that. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, it's, it's a lot easier to talk about than I than it would have been. Thank you. Thank you. One of the treasures of this parish is that we have a bishop who finds good books <laughs> and suggests that we read them and who also can comment on them. And here again, I had uh, that experience as I've had with uh, several books uh, that we've discussed here. Where else are we going, are we going to get a serious conversation like this? Not many places. Uh, and uh, so this one, it is again, uh, uh, I had experience that I've had with a number of the bishop's books too. You can't get it right away. It, uh, so it took a while for Fred Powell to order it and for my to, to get there. And what, finally I bought it from, from Fred and uh, read it, uh, kind of a, a quick read, and then discovered that I need to read it for a second time some of the passages and that I discovered it was a good book because the second time around there were ideas, concepts, experiences that came through that I didn't see mm -hmm. on, the, on, on the same on, thing happened for me too on the, on the first yeah. reading I, and I then yeah. the, I'm just thinking about your experience how I was trying to see what you saw as this 23 year old in Baltimore or so. You were describing it in such a way that I could see the buildings and the young woman and the family. And those were those were sort of literal things. But along the way, you were having a continual insight. Uh, into the spiritual dimensions, not only for your own life, which turned out to be permanent. I mean, there was something, uh, you're being given that kind of spiritual command of situation that has lasted throughout your whole ministry. As you said, it was, it was there, but it was given there. But now, then my question is, would I be able to experience what Martin experienced in some way? Uh, hmm. And that, in fact, trying to understand any of the literature of whether the, uh, the our scriptures or other scriptures or ancient, even ancient poets, a sixth century Greece and so on, isn't there always a dimension of insight that is is necessary to understand what it is they're experiencing? Uh, and the only way we can get there, I expect, how is it that we have eyes that can see that way? They said all through the New Testament stories, they said, I have seen the Lord. Well, uh, in, in, in a way, that's literal, but that's not literal. I have seen God in the, in the prayer. He saw God everywhere. Oh, well, how do you do that? And and there comes this word love again. You you have to have a certain knowledge in order to love. You have to know, uh, uh, and 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 without knowledge, you, you you can't truly love. But without love, you can't finally truly know. Uh, and. Uh, it, it just uh, opens uh, again. You think, well, here we're all living in a kind of literal world that we see, 
but there is a possibility of seeing in, in this world. Creation, it's continuous. That's this, that message is in this, this book. Uh, I, I, my response to the, you know, good old college students, uh, how, old is, how old is the universe? Is it 7,000 years old? Is it 7 about million thir- years about 13. old? 13.5. Is it, when did, <laughs> when did God create the universe? 13.7. That's the latest. That's, that's the latest. My, Keep changing. Again, the spirit, the kind of religious answer, it seems to me, was that no time ago. Yeah. God created the, the universe no time I ago. Know. Finally, the meaning of it all is, is God in some very large, deep, profound concept of that word. In and the we me- can experience it not only in your walks, but in, in all of the ancient literatures. And I think religion is as old, Christianity is as old as the, as the world, as they, the old church fathers used to say. Mm-hmm. One can explore primitive religions. One can explore animal religions. I once was writing a chapter on chimpanzee religion. Uh, that, that in all organisms, there is a, a, a God dimension, a God creation dimension, and we can, we, we can get some insight into it, but only in a way by means of both knowledge and love. You know how to say, in the beginning, in the beginning was God. Yes, but that beginning is not a, a historic beginning. I know. It says, it says, was God, was God. In the beginning is God. Is God, I mean, um, there, without, without any history, just there. Dean Reed, who I managed to, who clobbered my earlier idea of <coughs> having a, a term of Celtic spirituality, uh, he taught theology and Greek. And in my second year as a seminarian, when you're actually twice as smart as you are in your first year, um, <laughs> Dean Reed was, t- he was a Barthian. He loved Karl Barth. Uh, exactly. <laughs> I was reading um, uh, Tillich, and Bultmann is a biblical scholar, and they were my guys. And using classical Bartian language, Dean Reed would talk about God, and being the, the snot-nosed brat that I was, I th- Dean Reed, he wasn't the dean at the time, he was just Dr. Reed, Dr. Reed. Um, do you mean to speak of God as a being beside other beings, like a big fuzzy ball of love in the sky? And he looked at me and said, yes. I was floored by the clarity of his answer. I appreciated the clarity of his answer, but it didn't help me at all understanding God. Oh my God, I was... uh... That's good. I was uh, joining a church and the clergyman wanted to you know, get together with me before that to talk about the church and whatever. So we were at a restaurant and he knew that I was, you know, spent a lot of time fooling around in the out of doors. And he said, but we have to guard against pantheism, and, uh, which means that Every, every 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 little thing is in God, and I, no no. What I like to talk about is pantheism. God was in everything. I don't think he got it. They had this old catchword, pantheism. Oh, that's bad. That's worship of you know nature, as if there's something wrong with that. But I mean that was the. I didn't go any further with that, but. Anyway, I think that in his books, the number of times he's saying that, and we humans need to have this knowledge, or some of it. I don't mean specifically book language, but the the scripture, the, the scripture of the natural world, that knowledge, to some deep extent, 
if we are going to save the world that we have destroyed. Mm -hmm. And we are destroying it. And I have collected a huge amount of information about the specific ways in which it is being destroyed. And uh, at time is really running out. Uh, and uh, so, but the precedent has to be, I think more and more people become aware of the beauty of the world and therefore will be much more repulsed by what we're doing, doing to it mm -hmm. and be willing to change their lives in some ways to, to help protect it or, yeah. or have less impact on it. Um, I, think the, I think this learning about becoming acquainted with and loving, even if you love a dog, you love a bird, and there's a, and there's a favorite mouse you see scurrying, whatever it is, you know, that, that, that connects you to this much wider uh, spectrum of, of creation. Um, so, God, God is, you're to come back, pardon me, Jack. Yeah, so, go God is not a being alongside other beings, as you say. God is the being of beings. The ground of all, as the Kill it. God is the being, the capital B E I N G, of beings, not a being, a great being alongside atoms and uh, caterpillars. God is the being of atoms. I think it's the great heresy of caterpillars. <laughs> the heresy in that Barkian attitude is espoused by my prof theology professor. Is I think that love is meaningless until it becomes incarnate. Yeah. And that's the whole point of Jesus. And it's the point of what you're saying, Jack, about caring for the earth. Until our love becomes something other than theory, sitting around in a comfortable church or parish hall, <laughs> we're blowing smoke. And, uh, I think, and I think that ties into experience as I've been listening today to your story the different stories here a personal impact so the that experience in the emergency room that experience with the dump truck what you're talking about is love what John Muir was talking about um, when he took President Roosevelt out on that three-day trip that was the spark that led to creating the national parks Roosevelt was getting you experience and so and love usually comes from some form of experience if it's romantic love it's a relationship with partner if it's filial love it's the experience that that group has had together. And relationships are related back to experience. And I think what happens is we, we are so, so, we have so much a, um, a disconnect because we kind of have academics over here and experience over here. And we need to meld the academics with the experience in the same way that we need to bring everything in together. And so um, it, sustainability, for example, living sustainably is far different if I read it in a book than I spend a weekend at a retreat on a farm where they actually practice it. Mm. So I think that is uh, what really, like what I'm hearing today is, this, is, is these stories of experience are really, um, testimonials and like you go to the african-american church almost every sunday you had a testimonial i'm saved i'm all of drugs i found god you know you really get that uh, life and you feel the love in there mm -hmm. and so is it uh, um, uh, but if you don't have the academic underpinnings i mean you we might be off in some kind of heresy somewhere or cult and so the flip side is, 
I mean, awful things happen. You know, like you're getting Jimmy Jones and he's drinking, you got everybody drinking Kool Aid. <laughs> yeah. So you have to have both. We're coming to a close, and I want to end with a, another prayer, uh, but with the theological reflection ahead of time. Um, against all odds, I think that the Council of Nicaea got it right in 325. I am radically orthodox in my affirmation of the Nicene Creed. The church had been arguing for 250 years about who Christ, who Jesus Christ is, was, and will be. The docetists said, well, he only seemed to be human. He was actually fully divine, and the appearance as human, as human was just that. It was a, a kind of an, an appearance, not the reality. And others said, no, he was fully human. Um, uh, 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 fully human, and the divinity was sort of plonked down on top of him. Um, one of the earliest uh, heresies was uh, adoptionism, where Jesus was born as a perfectly normal human being, but turned out to be so good at being a human being, God decided to adopt him as a special son. Nicaea rejected all of those half, half understandings and insisted on holding together the insanity of saying both and. Jesus, the Christ, is both fully human and fully divine, indivisible, complete, and the, rep the, the perfect expression of God, fully incarnate, fully God. And that's a radical notion. And it is the, it's the whole point of the Trinity, that the, that the spirit that is Jesus and indwelt Jesus is the same spirit that drives all of creation, and it is the same spirit that dwells within us at our most aware moments. David, when you were hugging that man, you were loving him. And that's more powerful than everything else we can experience. I'm really proud of you for that. And so the Celts had a strong understanding of the Trinity. It echoes through all of their greatest prayers. I bind unto myself this day the strong name of the Trinity, um, the Larica. And MacLeod's prayer towards the end of his chapter. No, it's actually John Phillips' prayer, but it's modeled on Um, just no, it was it was um, McLeod's prayer that John Philip read, and he said, "Be thou triune God in the midst of us, as we give thanks for those who have gone from the sight of earthly eyes." They, in their nearer presence, in thy nearer presence, still worship with us in the mystery of the one family in heaven and on earth. If it be thy holy will, tell them how we love them, and how we miss them, and how we long to be with them again. Strengthen us to go on in loving service to all thy children. Thus shall we have communion with thee, and in thee with those who have gone before us. Thus shall we come to know within ourselves that there is no death, and that only a veil divides thin as gossamer. Be of good heart. The veil between us and God is as thin as gossamer. even thinner. Thank you all very much. Amen. It's time to go to chat. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.